Hello guys, my name is Edward Sereduk and today I would like to invite you to welcome you to a brand new teaching series entitled Saved for Eternity. And in this first session, I would like to start with a few questions that you may have asked yourself from time to time in your Christian life or maybe at least once in your life. And these questions are the following. Am I still saved? Was I ever saved in the first place? Have you ever had these kind of questions come to your mind as a born-again believer? I know I had them eating away at me many times, although I thought I was a genuine believer in Christ, born again, baptized in water, and saved. But why were these questions coming to me? Because I was still sinning as a Christian, and sometimes repeatedly in the same area. When that happened, I was feeling ashamed and sorry, and I was wondering, Will I ever see any real progress in holiness in my Christian life so that I don't have to worry or be afraid of losing my salvation? Will I ever over overcome completely and permanently sinful behaviors that keep reoccurring again and again, although I have confessed them and decided to change so many times? I didn't know what to do because I wanted so much to be pleasing to the Lord, but I felt hopeless. My conscience kept weighing me down with condemnation for years until I began to fear the accumulation of these sins had undone or would undo my eternal salvation somewhere in the near future. Although, as I said, I confessed them and I was genuinely sorry. I used to ask myself, how much will God bear with me until he gives up on me completely? Whenever I boarded the plane, I would cry before God and make sure I confessed all my sins so I would not be eternally lost in case the plane crashed. It may be hilarious to you and comical, or, uh, or you might, might do that too. But with these questions constantly bothering me, I became so disheartened in my Christian walk. Instead of rejoicing in my salvation, loving God more and more, and pursuing Him with an unburdened heart, I was always feeling unworthy, even when I may not have had a specific sin in mind. I was finding it difficult to pray or read the Bible at times. Even more problematic was the fact that I was regularly involved in public ministry in the church, and I was leading worship every week, preaching the Word and praying for people. And slowly, I lost all confidence in ministering to God and people. I became so self-focused I, that I lost sight of Christ and all He has done for me. And despite my best efforts and good intentions, I kept sinning. My unresolved sins continued to pile up, burdening my conscience and making me feel spiritually hopeless and paralyzed. I began to think I could never live a holy life and I would always be in condemnation, in guilt and depression. Mind you now, I wasn't living in grave sins like adultery, drugs, drinking, smoking, stealing, or lying. I just want to put those to rest because I was a pastor's kid. I was born and raised in a Christian family. But I still had some issues that I had to deal with. And one day after the church meeting, I seriously decided to give up on following the Lord because I was tired of fighting and pretending that I was well. I was also convinced that my Christian life had suffered irreparable damage and I was already lost. So I thought to myself, what's the use? I've already lost my salvation. Why try anymore? And if, you ever, if you, you've ever experienced something similar that I experienced, this series is for you. This, uh, these sessions are for you. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit had mercy on me and didn't leave me there. He slowly began revealing to me deeper truths about what really happened at the cross and about salvation. Now, can true believers who are born again and justified by faith in Christ, can they ever lose their salvation by sinning? That's the question. I soon realized this question has been a source of controversy for a long time among Christians. And this is indeed an issue of significant importance in practical Christian living. Think about it. On one hand, if there is no guarantee that salvation is permanent, believers like you and me may experience a great deal of anxiety and insecurity like I did, fear even. 
which undermines, undermining the effectiveness and the power of the gospel in their Christian lives, in our Christian lives. On the other hand, if salvation is secure and believers are preserved, saved, independently of their lives and actions, the result might be indifference to the moral and spiritual demands of the gospel, something called libertinism. Therefore, clarifying and establishing the scriptural teaching concerning the security of the believer is essential for a victorious life. And in history, there have been two predominant perspectives to this controversy on eternal security, on one in which our perseverance in faith and sanctification conditions the keeping of salvation, and the other in which salvation is secured by God eternally, independent of our sanctification. And in this series, I will advocate that genuine salvation is preserved by God forever, with sanctification being a result of this salvation and not a condition to maintain it. And I will accomplish this goal by first unfolding the, the, the biblical proofs according to which genuine believers in Christ can never lose their salvation. Then, in a, sec in a second big chapter, I will tackle the most common biblical objections to the eternal security of salvation for true born-again believers and attempt to answer them. And this series uh, is a continuation of my previous teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness, and I would encourage you to first listen to that one because it lays the foundation for this uh, series in which we are right now. And this series that we are right now, it describes another application or implication besides confession of sins and the Lord's Supper that I'm covering in the first in the previous series, uh, an application, another application of the reality that believers have become free of condemnation forever and their future sins have been eradicated as well. And let's start this first big chapter that is entitled Proofs of Eternal Salvation. And the first subsection in, in this chapter, uh, in, this, uh, in the first subsection, I will talk about a free and irrevocable gift. And let's read two passages that il illustrate the very nature of salvation and eternal life. Ephesians 2 verse 8. I'll read from New King James Version. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first proof that you as a born-again believer can never lose your salvation is the fact that salvation and eternal life are free gifts from God. Even the expression free gift is a pleonasm. Because any gift is free by the very definition of the word gift, right? But I used it here to make sure that we understand it's free. A gift means no strings attached, no conditions, no work or good deeds needed to earn or keep it. Knowing this gift doesn't come from a human being, but from the Almighty God, who is ever faithful and reliable, never changing, and gives only good and perfect gifts to people, according to James 1 verse 17. So knowing that this gift comes from the Almighty God gives us even more confidence and trust. Moreover, eternal justification of your sins is received by faith alone and independent of the works of the law. That means you did not receive your salvation based on your good works. It is not maintained by your good works done after the time of salvation, and it is not lost by your evil works. Now, what are the works of the law? They are good and holy deeds done for the Lord, but they are done through human effort and with the wrong purpose of keeping yourself right with God and be pleasing to Him. And since your salvation is independent of your works, it is secure and it is eternal. Romans 3, Romans 3 verse 28 shows this clearly. Let's read it. It says this. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's move a little bit forward. Salvation is also an irrevocable gift. How do we know that? The very nature of God, illustrated in Romans 11 verse 29, reveals to us this fact. Let's read it. Romans 11 verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Although the context of this verse is Israel's calling by God, it reveals something generally true about God's nature. And that is, once He has given a gift to someone, once He has called or has blessed someone, He doesn't repent or feel sorry for it no matter what. The gifts, the callings, and the blessings from God are always irrevocable. The born again have received the gift of righteousness and have been called to salvation. This gift and this calling are irrevocable from God's point of view once believers accept them by faith. Amen. Let's go to the next subsection of this chapter entitled Eternal Life's Definition. So according to many passages like Romans 6.23, John 3, verse 36, John 5, 24, and John 6, 47. Believers in Christ have eternal life already. How can they become then uneternal and temporal again? Among other things, the very definition of eternal, the term eternal, includes the concept of existence without end. Not only that, but this existence without end is full of the life of God, the quality of God's life. Another proof is the Holy Spirit's seal. According to John 14 verse 16, the Holy Spirit has been given to believers to abide with them and in them forever. Let's read the verse, John 14 verse 16. And I will pray the Father, says Jesus, and, I, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The, this verse doesn't add any qualifications, disclaimers, or conditions of how long the Holy Spirit will stay within believers. It just says forever. How can he abide forever in them if they can lose their salvation anytime? How can the Holy Spirit be taken back? How can forever this term become finite and oscillating? Oscillating. How can the eternal seal of the Holy Spirit described in Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14 and Ephesians 4 verse 30 and 2 Corinthians 1 verses 21 to 22 and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5, how can this seal be broken? It cannot. A spiritual seal done by God is eternal. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22 from New King James Version. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. See, it's a seal. It's a guarantee. Uh, let's move on. Another proof for, et for eternal salvation. It's uh, the terms eternal redemption and eternal inheritance that we find in some passages in the Bible. Hebrews 9 verse 12 and verses, verse 15, these two verses say that Jesus has obtained for us an eternal redemption and an eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9 12, so let's read it. Not with blood, blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And Hebrews 9.15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. By and large, the body of Christ believes in a momentary redemption and a temporary inheritance that is constantly in a state of fluctuation based on its performance, like the stock market. 
based on how you act, you can lose your salvation and then you need to be born again, again. However, if you could indeed lose your salvation at your next sin, I think the most loving thing that God the Father could do for you is to kill you and take you to heaven immediately after you receive Christ in your heart so that you would remain saved, right? Otherwise, it's a high risk for you to not to ever not make it, make it to heaven. Some people might say that the objective, objective eternal means only that redemption and inheritance are available to people for the length of eternity. They are there available for eternity. And indeed, eternal may not necessarily refer to the fact that once you have redemption and salvation and that you applied them to you, they are fixed and forever for you, no matter what you do. However, if we look at the context of Hebrews 9 and compare the old covenant where the high priest would enter once a year into the most holy place with the blood of animals to atone for the people, to to make atonement. If we compare that old covenant with the new covenant where Jesus entered once and for all uh, in the most holy place with his own blood, if we compare these two covenants, we can conclude that the eternal redemption Jesus obtained for us is also fixed and eternal in nature. So the term eternal signifies that redemption is not temporal or partial, but covers all time and all sins. Hallelujah. Now, another proof for eternal salvation or eternal security is the imperishable seed of the Word of God. And this argument comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, which talks about the seed of the Word of God. Let's read it. It says this, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. The new creation is born again from the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So since the Word of God lives forever, exists forever, how could the new creation, born of this seed, ever perish again? Right? It cannot. Uh, Moving forward, another proof for eternal security is uh, the fact that the new creation is made one spirit with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, it says that once you are saved and you join yourself to the Lord, you are made one spirit with Him. Now let's read it. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. One spirit. How could you ever be separated from him again. That would mean a breach in the Trinity itself, which is impossible. Even when Jesus was on the cross, he was not separated from the Trinity in his spirit. And that's another discussion. He, he, was, he died in his body and soul, but in his spirit, he remained connected with the Trinity. He was still one with the Trinity. Another proof for eternal salvation is the last Adam's power. Uh, and this biblical this argument comes from Romans 5, which describes the last Adam, meaning Jesus Christ, as much more powerful than the first Adam. In what way? Before Christ came, nobody could have fallen away from death and darkness, fallen away between double quotes. So they nobody could have fallen away from death and darkness into righteousness, right? no matter how many good, holy works they did, right? Right. Now, if people who are made new creations, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, and are transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God, according to Colossians 1.13, if these new creations can fall back into darkness because of their sins and evil works, in the sense that their nature becomes sin again and they lose their salvation and their state of righteousness, that makes Jesus Christ and the nature of God much weaker than Adam. Do you agree with me? And ultimately, it makes life weaker than death. However, Romans 5 describes the last Adam as way stronger and greater than the first Adam. Amen. 
And the last subsection of this that I'm going to cover today, uh, which is another proof for eternal security, is natural life versus spiritual life. In Acts 17, verse 28, uh, it says that the natural earthly life cannot uphold itself, but people live, move, and have their being in God. Let's read the verse. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Now, since God sustains natural earthly life even more, how can spiritual life then uphold itself? God must maintain the faith, the love, and the holy activity that He has originated through the means of people's free will. Since God preserves the natural life, we can expect Him to uphold the spiritual one the same way as seen in Philippians 1, 6, Jude 1, verse 24, and 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8. And let's read these passages. They are so interesting. Philipp Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it in you. Jude 1 verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. With exceeding joy. So who is able to keep you from stumbling? You or God? God of course. And 1 Corinthians 1 8. He who, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So I will close here uh, because I, I, believe, I gave you already a lot and I believe you need to review and go back to what I said today and meditate and allow the Holy Spirit to, to expand and give you understanding, revelation, so that you can apply these verses to you, these, the, these teachings to you, and receive life, receive peace, receive joy. I hope you were blessed as I was blessed while I was uh, teaching this, uh, and that you receive life through, through this uh, preaching, through this teaching, life, peace, joy. That's my goal. And I hope that the Holy Spirit will continue to build you up, to become, um, to manifest Jesus more and more in your daily life and be free of condemnation, be free of all these bondages, all these lies of the devil, lies of the enemy, so to live for God uh, and, and be, be effective in His kingdom. Amen. Amen.